Thank you. Um, I'd like to start off by thanking the Animal Section Committee for allowing me to share my research, my research with you in this forum. As we're all well aware, ocean acidification is a serious global problem. As anthropogenic emissions continue under business as usual scenarios, increases in atmospheric CO2 are expected to be mirrored in the ocean, leading to rapid and wide-scale ocean acidification. In my research, I focus on how these changes affect the acid-based physiology of marine organisms and the implications that these organismal responses have for other endpoints like behavior. Organismal responses to elevated ambient CO2 vary and typically lie along a continuum. Organisms on the left, such as less active and sessile marine invertebrates, have a limited capacity to protect pH and can experience metabolic suppression. In contrast, animals on the right, such as fish and active marine invertebrates, are considered to be strong acid-base regulators and readily defend pH through the accumulation of bicarbonate. Decades of foundational research has given us the profile of an acid-base regulator that's quite consistent across species. Today I'll be using the Gulf toadfish as, a, as an example uh, for reasons that will become clear shortly. When regulators experience an increase in CO2 in the environment, they experience a respiratory acidosis that you see here on the figure on the right. To compensate, they accumulate bicarbonate to achieve net base retention, allowing pH to return to pre-exposure levels despite continued high pCO2. This leads to a new steady state in the body where pH is maintained at pre-exposure levels. However, both bicarbonate and pCO2 remain elevated. It's also important to note that in many cases, this bicarbonate is exchanged in a one-to-one -one molar ratio with chloride, which has been added to the figure on the right. In 2012, I was a part of the first study to examine this regulatory ability in a marine fish over a range of ocean, acidific ocean acidification relevant CO2 levels, ranging from present day values of 380 all the way up to 1900, which corresponds to global averages for year 2300. In this study, we found that Gulf toadfish exposed to levels of 750 microatmospheres or greater for a 24 hour period showed complete pH compensation via the elevation of plasma bicarbonate, showing that at these low CO2 levels, we do in fact see evidence of compensation. And although allowing for the, P the defense of pH, these, this new city state is now hypothesized to underlie a, a many downstream potential consequences, including but certainly not limited to altered mitochondrial function, increased otolith growth, changes to metabolic rate, and increased intestinal ion transport. In addition, more than 50 studies to date have examined behavior as a potential downstream consequence of pH compensation. Disruptions have been noted to multiple sensory systems, including hearing, olfaction, and vision. In addition, when looking at endpoints measuring broader cognitive function, CO2 has been found to cause loss of lateralization, impaired learning, and increased boldness. Now from the pictures you see up here, you can imagine that most of the studies to date have been performed on fish, but recent research has also been extended to invertebrates where we're seeing similar patterns, at least in some species. And because these effects are seemingly widespread and well conserved across animal groups, it of course becomes important to understand the potential underlying mechanism. This was first addressed by Nilsen et al. and colleagues in 2012, where he proposed that acid-based regulators could be most at risk for behavioral disruptions. And this is due to this new steady state that is happening in the body. Specifically, changes in bicarbonate and chloride ions are thought to alter the way these ions move across the GABA-A receptor, an important receptor um, that is responsible for background inhibitory responses throughout the fish and invertebrate nervous system. In this model, under control conditions, these ions typically move into the cell, leading to a hyperpolarizing and inhibitory response. However, under elevated CO2, these ion, the, the, the movement of these ions was hypothesized to be reverse, leading to a depolarizing excitatory response and associated impaired behavior. And to test GABA-A receptor involvement, um, CO2 exposed fish showing a behavioral disruption were treated with gabazine, which is a GABA-A receptor antagonist designed to close the channel and prevent ion movement. CO2 exposed animals showing disruption treated with gabazine no longer showed impaired behavior.
This hypothesis has since been tested in numerous studies across different species that you see listed here below with similar methodologies where an animal showing a CO2-induced behavior disruption is treated with a GABA-A pharmacological agent and then subsequently shows restored behavior. And while I believe these studies show a clear link between acid-base regulatory ability and behavioral impairment via altered GABA function, I do think the field would benefit from two important considerations moving forward. First, although alterations to ion gradients are thought to underlie many of these behavioral impairments we've noted to date, um, only a handful of studies have measured acid-base relevant uh, parameters at ocean acidification relevant CO2 levels in marine fish. And even fewer studies have measured the relevant extracellular and intracellular acid-base parameters in a marine fish that also shows a behavioral disturbance. Second, while these studies clearly implicate GABA-A receptor involvement, whole animal exposure to GABA pharmacological agents limits resolution in targeting specific neural pathways and linking those to specific behaviors. So in light of these considerations, the overall goal of my research is to better understand mechanisms underlying CO2 disruptions. In the first objective, um, I, I measured extracellular and intracellular acid-base parameters in a species known to show a CO2-induced CO2 behavioral disruption, with the prediction, of course, that a compensatory response could be matched with behavioral impairment. In objective two, I also sought to measure acid-base parameters and behavior, but in an organism I believe is well-suited for future neurophysiological research. So in objective, in objective one, the spiny damselfish was used in, uh, in Lizard Island, Australia, at the Lizard Island Research Station. After collection, we exposed these animals for four days to either control or elevated CO2 at 1,900 microatmospheres. We chose four days because this time period has been previously demonstrated to, to elicit both the CO2 compensatory response in addition to behavioral impairments, after which we measured both acid-based parameters and behavioral assays, behavioral assay. For acid-based measurements, brain and plasma bicarbonate were measured in addition to pH. And for behavioral measurement, the two-choice volume chamber was used. In this particular test, the animal is given a choice between two independent water streams, one that's just controlled seawater and a second that is controlled seawater containing a chemical alarm cue containing extract from an injured conspecific. And ideally, the animal should avoid that if, it, uh, if they're functioning properly. You can then measure the percent, uh, the percent time spent in each stream. Taking a look at the results, first at the acid-base measurements, we see that both in the brain and the plasma, there is a significant elevation of bicarbonate, and that there is also an overshoot in the PHI in the brain. Together, these, re these results indicate that there is evidence of compensation in the species at the CO2 level. In terms of the behavioral measurements, we see that species, or sorry, damselfish exposed to elevated CO2 spends significantly more time in the chemical alarm queue, indicating a behavioral impairment. Overall, I believe the results of this first study indicate that pH compensation does occur at CO2 levels where there are significant behavioral changes. And this could suggest that behavior is in fact a downstream impairment associated with acid-base regulation. Furthermore, evidence of compensation aligns with changes to ion gradients predicted by the GABA-A hypothesis. We were able to model this in this paper, but I won't have time to share that with you today, but I'm happy to talk about it uh, for, at future days in the conference this week. So I wanted to continue looking and exploring at, at mechanisms underlying disruptions, but I also had to acknowledge some of the inherent limitations in working with complex vertebrate nervous systems. So in objective two, I again sought to measure acid-base parameters and behavior, but with a broader intention of assessing this invertebrate for, as a future model for CO2 studies and research. As an ideal model, I believe an organism should possess three key traits. First, I think they should have a well-mapped and simple nervous system, and hopefully these well-mapped nervous systems would be linked to re reproducible behavioral assays. Aplasia californica, known as the California sea hare, are widely known to meet the first two criteria perfectly. They've been used for decades as a biomedical research model on learning and memory, and in fact, Eric Kandel won the Nobel Prize for his pioneering work examining the cellular basis for learning and memory um, back in this, I think in, from his work in the 60s and the 70s. 
Finally, in addition to these first two criteria, for use as a model in CO2 research, I think that it would be ideal for an organism to show the acid-base profile of a regulator and show bicarbonate accumulation because there's, we previously de demonstrated there's likely a link between regulatory ability and behavioral impairment. So in, object, in objective two, I measured acid-base parameters and behavior in aplesia exposed to either control, 1,000 in end-of-century prediction, or 3,000 microatmospheres CO2. For acid-base measurements, both bicarbonate and pH were taken, and uh, hemolymph was stored for future ion analyses. Two well-established behavioral assays were performed as well for the species. And the writing reflects the animal is released from the, right, from the water column, and the amount of time it takes for the animal to orient itself and take its first crawling step is measured. And the tail with drought reflex, it's a defensive reflex where the short tap to the tail elicits the animal to retract the tail. And both the time it takes for the animal to relax, in addition to the percent body length can both withdrawn can be measured. First, taking a look at the acid base measurements, we see that in, he in hemolymph, the elevation of pCO2 led to a significant accumulation of bicarbonate at both CO2 levels. Interestingly, at 1,000, the ocean acidification relevant level, this bicarbonate accumulation allowed for perfect pH compensation. However, at 3,000, we see the magnitude of the increase in bicarbonate relative to the control is slightly smaller, which likely explains the mild acidosis that is seen on the right. Altogether, though, it's the significant accumulation of bicarbonate, both of these CO2 levels, that I believe makes this a potentially good model organism for future studies on CO2 uh, behavioral impairments. For behavior, we found no differences in the writing reflex, or the amount of time to write. However, in the tail shell reflex, um, at both CO2 levels, there was a significant reduction in the time it took for the tail to relax, but no effect on the percent of the body withdrawn. So overall, conclusions from this portion of the study are first, that aplesia do elevate bicarbonate at both CO2 levels, which may explain some of those alterations that I've shown you to the tail withdrawal reflex. This elevation of bicarbonate led to full pH compensation at 1,000, an OA relevant level, but not at 3,000, which invites uh, exploration for potential thresholds uh, at this level. In addition, the reduction in the time it took for the tail to relax could suggest a decline in anti-predator responses which is something that's been noted in many other species to date. So thinking back to our criteria, we've already established that they meet the first two very well from previous research, but now I also believe that they do meet the third criteria as well because they're able to elevate bicarbonate at both CO2 levels and more specifically have, exhibit complete pH compensation at 1,000 microatmospheres. I'm excited to continue working on this model, and I'd now like to share with you some examples of how I believe our previous knowledge um, on the neuro neurophysiolo neurophysiology of this species could benefit us in further exploring CO2 mechanisms of disturbance, using the CO2 altered tail withdrawal reflex as an example. Aplesia offered the advantage of using reduced preparations where you can actually extract the complete neural network responsible for a given reflex, as seen for the tail withdrawal reflex diagram here on the right. In addition, their large neurons make single cell patch clamp recordings feasible. Together, in these preparations, we we're able to test the electrophysiological responses of specific neurons using tar targeted pharmacological agents. And in addition, we can manipulate bathing media to mimic stressors like CO2. In this reflex, while, while specific GABAergic responses have not been well studied, the sensory neurons in the tail shell reflex are known to rely on glutamate as their primary excitatory neurotransmitter, and under certain training regimens, this reflex is also sensitive to serotonin. So in addition to studying GABA within this reflex, we could also look at potential alternative mechanisms of CO2-induced behavioral disruptions. Finally, in addition to these advantages, uh, we should have a sequenced and well-annotated genome, and RNA can actually be extracted from single neurons because they are so large. For an even more targeted approach, um, the feeding assay, the, excuse me, the biting reflex is one reflex where we, ha we have specific GABAergic responses. So the feeding motor network of aplesia, there are at least three interneurons known to show GABA immunoreactivity and also invoke inhibitory postsynaptic potential. 
obviously inviting specific hypotheses about CO2-induced behavioral disruptions within this reflex. Fine, over, overall, I believe both my findings in the damselfish and the aplysia suggest that acid-based regulatory ability and behavioral impairment could be linked, although, of course, alternative mechanisms could be at play as well. Further exploration of the GABA receptor hypothesis and or additional mechanisms would benefit from using a model organism like aplysia. And finally, in addition to the outlined neurophysiological advantages I've shared with you, these animals have a, a short uh, lifespan, a one-year life cycle, that makes them ideal for potential long-term or transgenerational studies that, as we've realized over the last few years, is very much needed in our field to really truly assess species sensitivity in future oceans. I'd like to conclude by acknowledging the co-authors on the three respective studies I've shared with you today, especially recognizing Rebecca Zlatkin, who's been crucial in uh, performing the aplysia studies. Special thanks also to the individuals and the institutions on the right, and also I'd like to thank SCB and my other funding sources that allowed me conduct, to conduct this research and be here today. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Questions for Rachel. I was just wondering, uh, I think the idea of transgenerational studies really.